back with you once again, and tonight I think we're going to do a show that is probably going to be one of the most important shows we've ever done on this series. Uh, if America's Evil Genius were a sitcom, then tonight would be the episode that you would hear the advertisement coming on earlier in the day that says, Tonight, on a very special America's Evil Genius. This is going to be one of those shows that you're going to remember uh, a couple of weeks from now, a couple of months from now, maybe a year from now, because I think it illustrates in, in raw form what the entire election of 2012 is going to be all about. You know, for the last two or three years, during the Obama presidency and even prior to that when he was running for office, you often heard those of us on the right, those of us who are conservatives, you often heard a lot of criticism from us about Barack Obama. And sometimes we would infer, many times actually, we would infer that his viewpoints, his motivations were socialist in nature, maybe even communist in nature, maybe that Obama was anti-American in his approach to government and how society should be run. And it, it seems like every time we made statements like that, many other people would criticize us for making those statements and say that we were overreacting, or that we were trying to scare people, or we were just afraid of him, or, or any number of things. And that it was all an overreaction, and Obama's viewpoints really weren't as far to the left as we were saying they were. And that he really wasn't out of line with American principles the way that we have always said that he is. However, earlier this week, I think some proof came out that Obama is every bit the socialist that we've always said he was. You know, we all understand that any politician of any party in any political office will oftentimes use their, their wording or, or their speeches or their word choice that they use to, to kind of uh, hide what their exact viewpoints are at times or, or to soften what they really believe and to make it more acceptable to the public at large. And certainly Barack Obama has done this over the last two or three years, as has nearly every other politician of either party. But recently, last week, in the state of Kansas, Barack Obama made a speech. And this was a speech that was very important because I think the curtain came up on who Barack Obama really is. I think the mask came off of who Barack Obama really is and what Barack Obama actually believes. There is a speech in some little town in Kansas, and I'm not even going to try and pronounce the name of it, you know, Okachoka Kobe or something, I don't know. But it was the same speech that Teddy Roosevelt had made uh, a speech in nearly a century ago calling for a new nationalism in the United States of America. And Obama tried to place himself in this day and time and in this town as the second coming of Teddy Roosevelt. Setting aside that Teddy Roosevelt was one of the more overrated presidents we've ever had, Obama took this tack as an opportunity to get his re-election campaign kind of jump-started, if you will, or kick-started, and to really drive home the, the class warfare shtick that he's so, so hell-bent on. This was a speech, and I'm not exaggerating when I say this, a speech that could have been given by a Joe Stalin, or could have been given by a Karl Marx, or could have been given by a Lenin. This was a speech that showed how dangerous and anti-American Barack Obama is. How Barack Obama is, in my estimation, the most serious domestic threat that our nation faces. Now what I want to do today is go through some select clips from that speech and react to them. And illustrate for you uh, how Barack Obama is anti-everything that America stands for. Now, certainly I do not have time in this presentation to go through the entire speech. He, he went on for 45 minutes, an hour, or something like that. But I would encourage you at home to take the time to view this entire speech. This is very important to hear who this man is and what he believes. Now, there's several places you can find the speech in its entirety without any commentary or anything else. Uh, there is a user on YouTube called Kansas Watchdog TV. That user has the entire speech in two parts uninterrupted and you can view the whole thing for yourself or if it's easier for you to to kind of take the speech on the go and and maybe read a full transcript of it there's several places on the internet where you can do that i happen to find the full transcript at a blog entitled www.maggiesnotebook.com that's one of many places you can find the entire transcript of the speech but what i wanted to do tonight was to pull out a few specific points that obama made in order to illustrate for you that this man is the antithesis of anti-Americanism. Now, the first place I wish to start is actually just one sentence, one sentence he made early in the speech. And it's a sentence that the first time you hear it, 
you might not think amounts to much of anything, but I think this sentence and the word choice he uses illustrates the mentality and the perspective that Barack Obama brings to how he views the way in which American society should be headed. Hit it. And ever since, there's been a raging debate over the best way to restore growth and prosperity, restore balance, restore fairness. Restore balance, restore fairness. Now think about that for a second. He used the phrases restore balance and restore fairness in the same sentence. Now, that would indicate to me that he must view those two things, restoring balance and restoring fairness, he must view those two things as either being the same goal or being goals that are very similar, that they're almost concurrent. That if you attempt to restore balance, you will then restore fairness. If you attempt to restore fairness, you will then restore balance. But are balance and fairness really the same thing? Let's think about that kind of, kind of deeply for a second. Because Barack Obama just glances over this every time he talks about it. We want to restore balance. We want to restore fairness. We're all familiar with the phrase, all men are created equal. We've heard that from our constitutional classes in high school. We hear almost all the time in terms of politics. And that is certainly true. All men are created equal in the sense of the law, in the sense of our rights. True, in those areas, all men are created equal. But what so often goes unstated is that outside of those areas, outside of the law, outside of our rights, when it comes to things like our abilities, our work ethic, our intellect, our ability to perceive things and, and to solve problems, our creativity, and any other number of characteristics, individual characteristics that you can think of for human beings, the fact of the matter is all men are not created equal. All men have a differing set of individual characteristics. All men have a different set of work ethic, a different amount of work ethic, a different amount of intelligence, a different amount of being able to see a problem and solve it. Some people can naturally do that. Others have to learn how to do it. Some will never have that ability, at least in the amounts that others do. Some people are very creative. Some people are not. We all have a very unique combination of those aspects of ourselves. And therefore, we are not created equal. We all have different things that we bring to the table and in varying amounts. Well, it stands to reason that in a fair society, in a fair system, understanding that we are not created equal in terms of our ability, etc., that in a fair society, we would not have balance, that imbalance would naturally arise. That people who bring to the table a better set of individual attributes, a better work ethic, better, better intelligence, better any number of things than the next guy. In a fair environment, those people have a higher likelihood of rising to the top. And those that don't bring those things to the table, they should have a lower likelihood of rising through the ranks. After all, if you had a football game, in a fair football game, if you've got one team that's clearly better than the other, then the team that's clearly better should have the better chance of winning. Is that right? Of course it is. So in a fair environment, you will naturally have imbalance. That's why it is so dangerous when you hear Barack Obama or anybody else use the word balance in the same breath as the word fairness. You cannot have both at the same time. In a fair environment, you will have imbalance. So the very fact that Barack Obama is talking about correcting imbalance so tells you that he does not want fairness at all. So that's how we started the speech. That was the premise from which he began working. And then from there, he went on to something we've seen him do many times over the last couple of years, blaming the previous administration, the George W. Bush administration, the last 10 years of American history for the fiscal pickle that we're in right now. Hit it. Now, in the midst of this debate, there are some who seem to be suffering from a kind of collective amnesia. After all that's happened, after the worst economic crisis, the worst financial crisis since the Great Depression, they want to return to the same practices that got us into this mess. In fact, they want to go back to the same policies that stacked the deck against middle class Americans for way too many years. And their philosophy is simple. We are better off when everybody is left to fend for themselves 
and play by their own rules. I am here to say they are wrong. Here in Kansas to reaffirm my deep conviction that we're greater together than we are on our own. Now this is where Barack Obama has it all wrong, and he's had it all wrong from day one. It is ludicrous to look at where we're at financially right now and in the uh, fiscal issues that we have and say that it is entirely to be laid at the doorstep of George W. Bush. And hey, likewise, unlike a lot of other conservatives, I will not tell you that we're at this perilous position strictly because of Barack Obama. We are not. He has certainly poured a lot of gasoline on the fire, make no mistake about that. But the actual root cause of our fiscal issues go way, way back in our history. It's not Obama's fault, at least in terms of starting it. It wasn't started by George W. Bush, despite what the left will tell you. If you want to know the root cause of the problem, go all the way back to the early part of the 20th century. Go back to the Woodrow Wilsons of the world. You see, the problem that led us to this fiscal precipice that we are at right now is the very transition that we had in, in the way we view American government. We went from a situation where we used to view government in America as an entity that will protect our borders, protect our life and liberty, and settle the odd dispute and little more, to a situation to the 20th century where we started to view government as the arbiter of all things, as the provider of opportunity, as the great equalizer, as the entity that would make sure everybody had opportunity, and everybody had basic needs, and everybody had a road to the top, access to the ladder of success. That's a pretty profound difference in how we looked at government. And then you move forward and you look at all the entitlement programs we have, things like Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, things that fiscally are on autopilot. People don't get together every year or every couple of years and determine what percentage of the budget will be allocated to those things. As we've said on a previous presentation, those formulas are on autopilot. And those entitlement programs take up over 56% of our entire budget. So if you're wondering where the money's going, where this money's being spent that we don't have, there's 56% of it, the entitlement programs. And those entitlement programs arose because we started viewing government as a solver of problems instead of a defender of the republic and the occasional arbiter of a dispute. Because we increased, as a nation, what we expected out of government, it gave rise to these insolvent programs which are unsustainable. Think about the Great Society, Lyndon Johnson's pet project that was designed to bring more opportunity to the poor areas in the African American community, but instead it did the opposite. It curtailed the growth that was happening in the urban areas and in black America through the 1940s and 1950s. It put an artificial ceiling there. And now the African American community and, and, and the poor community, the urban community, is as in bad of a shape or worse than it was 40 years ago. That was a great society for you. And all because we expected government to do more than just protect our borders and settle the occasional dispute. We started to expect government to solve all problems. But the great society solved no problems. The entitlement programs solved no problems. Instead, they created more. Look at the Community Reinvestment Act and the rise of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and the demand from government that banks start lending to people who had no reasonable expectation of ever being able to afford a home. And that's where the worthless paper was brought into the system. The worthless paper that everybody complains about Wall Street selling and reselling but they never talk about how that worthless paper was brought into the system to begin with. It was because of the government. It was because of the Democrats in the 1970s. It was because of the Barney Franks of the world. It was those type of things. Those are three examples of the collectivist mentality that has spent the money we don't have to form a government which we largely did not need. That's where the problem is. But Barack Obama doesn't seem to see that. He wants to look no further back than the year 2000. He doesn't want to realize that these ideas started percolating in the 19-teens or were exacerbated in the 1940s or that Lyndon Johnson really put the foot on the accelerator in the 1960s. No, no, no. 
Barack Obama doesn't want to see that. Let me tell you, the last 75 years of the 20th century and what we've seen, if that's what advocacy government will get you, I would stay as far away from advocacy government as I possibly could. But Obama doesn't see that. And then later in the speech, Obama put on his amateur economist cap, and he tried to compare himself to Teddy Roosevelt and analyze the marketplace as it stands today. Over the last few decades, huge advances in technology have allowed businesses to do more with less. And it's made it easier for them to set up shop and hire workers anywhere they want in the world. And many of you know firsthand the painful disruptions this has caused for a lot of Americans. Factories where people thought they would retire suddenly picked up and went overseas, where workers were cheaper. Steel mills that needed 100 or 1,000 employees are now able to do the same work with 100 employees. So layoffs too often became permanent, not just a temporary part of the business cycle. And these changes didn't just affect blue-collar workers. If you were a bank teller or a phone operator or a travel agent, you saw many in your profession replaced by ATMs and the Internet. Today, even higher skilled jobs like accountants and middle management can be outsourced to countries like China or India. And if you're somebody whose job can be done cheaper by a computer or someone in another country, you don't have a lot of leverage with your employer when it comes to asking for better wages or better benefits, especially since fewer Americans today are part of a union. Now, just as there was in Teddy Roosevelt's time, there is a certain crowd in Washington who, for the last few decades, have said, let's respond to this economic challenge with the same old tune. The market will take care of everything, they tell us. If, if we just cut more regulations and cut more taxes, especially for the wealthy, our economy will grow stronger. Sure, they say, there will be winners and losers, but if the winners do really well, then jobs and prosperity will eventually trickle down to everybody else. <laughs> and, they argue, even if prosperity doesn't trickle down, well, that's the price of liberty. Well, there goes Obama, complaining about things like the Internet and ATMs and technology making certain jobs obsolete. And you wonder if Barack Obama would have been around in the early 20th century if he would have castigated the, the automobile manufacturers for putting all of those buggy whip factories out of existence. You know, the market changes over time. People's demands change over time. And people who are in business, people who are working, they have to change with those times in order to remain competitive. That's always happened in America. This is nothing new. It's nothing new at all. Now, is there, are there any of us who would willingly give up our ATMs or our cell phones or our Internet access just so a couple of additional people somewhere could keep a job? I certainly wouldn't. And if you're honest about it, I doubt you would either. The bottom line is that people... Individuals, not only companies, but individuals as well, have to evolve to keep pace with what the marketplace is and with what the demands are of the American public and to keep themselves viable as a labor source in the world. But what Obama doesn't understand is that it is not the job of the government to make sure that people keep up with the marketplace. It is not the job of the government to make sure that individual workers evolve as a marketplace evolves. Instead, that is each of our responsibilities individually. And as we compete with each other, if I have evolved and you haven't, I will then have a better opportunity for a job than you will. As it should be. Because if you allow government to take that responsibility then all you're doing is making it unfair for those who saw the change in the road before everybody else did. You're curtailing their success. You're putting, in NASCAR terms, you're putting a restrictor plate on their success so that others who are less prepared and others who have not been as perceptive 
will have artificial success at the expense of those who would have been naturally successful. That's not America, folks. That's socialism. That is flat-out socialism. And then Obama goes on to castigate the right once again. Now, it's a simple theory. And, and we have to admit, it, it's one that speaks to our rugged individualism and our healthy skepticism of too much government. That's, that's in America's DNA. And that theory fits well on a bumper sticker. <laughs> but here's the problem. It doesn't work. It has never worked. Now that last passage is probably the most fundamental difference between Barack Obama and the American right, and probably the most fundamental difference between Barack Obama and America as a whole, as anything that is out there. He wants to make it sound as though our skepticism of government has never worked, has never been successful in America. If you will pardon my French, Mr. President, Bullshit. That has been exactly the, the lack of government, the skepticism of government, has been exactly what has built our nation. Think back to the early 20th century and the, the immigrants that, that came over here. You'll hear Democrats all the time talk about how America was built in the backs of immigrants. And to a large degree, there's a lot of truth to that. But think back to the immigrants of yesteryear that were in the cities and in New York City and a lot of other places in the early 20th century. Those immigrants, you know, maybe they'd open a shop or maybe they'd put a, a, a food cart on a corner of a street or any number of other things. And they did not have to go through all the onerous government regulation that we have to go through today. They did not have to jump through all the government hoops that we have to do today. They don't have to get all the licensing that you have to have today. You know, and if somebody came over here as an immigrant and they had a job as a janitor or working in a coal mine or a factory or whatever, they oftentimes didn't worry about how they were being treated. They worried about what kind of money they could make and what they could then do with it. How they could parlay that into something better. That's the rugged individualism that built America, but Barack Obama flat out told you that it doesn't work. You know, I think back to an example that one of, one of America's great thinkers, Walter E. Williams, often uses this. Put yourself in this position. Think of yourself as an unemployed person. Maybe you are actually unemployed. And maybe you wake up one morning and you say, you know, I've got to do something today to put some food on the table and, and, and move forward a step. I need to do something to provide for my family today. What can I do? Well, I have a car out there in the garage, so maybe I can put a sign on that car that says taxi and I could, I could drive around town and pick people up and shuttle them from point A to point B. And maybe if I charge a little bit less than the established taxi companies are charging, maybe I could get a few people moved from here to there and I can make a little bit of money and I can feed my family today. Great idea, isn't it? Except in today's environment, you really could not do that. Because in most municipalities, most cities, you have to go through such regulation and licensing to open a taxi cab company or to, to turn your own car into a taxi that it's cost prohibitive to do so. In New York City, it costs at least $10,000 to get all the licensing you need to operate a taxi cab service. Well, how does that help the people that are out of work? How does that help the people that want to do something to further their own lives? It doesn't. It's a place where government is restricting people's success rather than encouraging it. The bottom line is that the rugged individualism that Barack Obama claims it didn't work when it was tried in the past, that rugged individualism that fits so well on a bumper sticker, by God it did work. It built everything this country had through the 20th century. It won World War II for us for crying out loud. It wasn't Franklin Roosevelt and the New Deal that stopped the Great Depression, that exacerbated it. It was World War II that ended it. It was the fact that Europe was in shambles, Europe was in ashes, Asia was not developed, and we were the only country in the world that had the industry that could provide for everybody else. And that's what built the industry in our country. That's what built the economy in our country. Obama will never give us credit for that, though, and neither will the rest of the left. And from there, Obama then goes back to the tired liberal meme of people just not getting a fair shot Oh, it's just so unfair. Listen. It's not a view that we should somehow turn back technology or 
put up walls around America. It's not a view that says we should punish profit or success or pretend that government knows how to fix all of society's problems. It is a view that says, in America, we are greater together. When everyone engages in fair play and everybody gets a fair shot and everybody does their fair share. So let me ask you, President Obama, who exactly is not getting a fair shot in this country? Who exactly is being denied opportunity in this country? Now, you, if you were to answer that question, Mr. Obama, you would probably say, oh, well, well you know, the 1% have all the opportunity, the 99% don't. But there is where you're making a mistake. You are, and, and the left as well, you are all confusing an unequal amount of success with an unequal amount of opportunity. There is an unequal amount of success, an inordinate amount of success towards certain people. As we said earlier, that's because certain people just frankly bring more to the table than others. But there is not an unequal amount of opportunity. Are people denied an education in this country? No. Are people denied libraries and a chance to, to, to read and research and develop themselves in this country? No. Are people denied any number of things that are required to improve themselves? Absolutely not. Not at all. We, we bend over backwards in this nation and have for a hundred years to make sure everybody has an opportunity if they want it, and even that some people that don't want an opportunity have it. We're obsessed by it, practically. Now, I think some of that needs to change, but nevertheless, when you look at the last hundred years of American society, the one thing you can say is that we do not have a lack of opportunity. So when you say that people are not getting a fair shot, it is absolute hogwash. You are using the idea of an inequity of success and confusing it with an inequity of opportunity. That's absolute bull. We all have opportunities in this country. Some people just take better advantage of those opportunities than others. That's all it boils down to. And then Obama took this idea and moved it towards the world of education as a whole. Let's listen. But we need to meet the moment. We've got to up our game. We need to remember that we can only do that together. It starts by making education a national mission. A national mission. Government and businesses. Parents and citizens. In this economy, a higher education is the surest route to the middle class. The unemployment rate for Americans with a college degree or more is about half the national average. And their incomes are twice as high as those who don't have a high school diploma. Which means we shouldn't be laying off good teachers right now. We should be hiring them. We shouldn't be expecting less of our schools. We should be demanding more. We, we shouldn't be making it harder to afford college. We should be a country where everyone has a chance to go and doesn't rack up $100,000 of debt just because they went. Oh dear, it's such a horrible situation, isn't it? Give me a break. Lack of education in this nation is not the problem. We do not have the problem of a lack of education. This generation of American citizens have spent more time in school in their lives than any generation before them. More people today get high school diplomas than at any other time in American history. I think back to my grandparents' generation. It was not uncommon then to hear of people that, that had only an eighth grade education or not even that. You never hear or very rarely hear anymore of people that have to you know, quit school and go to work. It happens once in a great while, but it's very rare. It was commonplace 50, 60, 70 years ago. And whereas in olden times, a high school diploma was almost a luxury that, that you, you almost had to be able to afford to get one. That's not the case now. Anybody in this nation who wants a high school diploma can go get one. Likewise, more people are going to college and getting college degrees than ever before. So the lack of education is not the problem. 
One of the problems is instead the emphasis of the education that they are getting. We've got kids sitting in school for hours upon hours upon hours and years upon years upon years through elementary school, middle school, high school, and now college for a growing number of people. And yet, many of them come out without the skills that people came out of high school with or came out of junior high with 30, 40, 50 years ago. People in the olden days who came out with only a high school education or even a junior high education seem to have more on the ball and be able to make judgments better than this generation of college educated kids can. Now why is that? I believe the reason is because our education system and our educational establishment has focused more on the theoretical side of learning and the quote intellectual side of learning than they have on the practical side of learning. Oh, we teach all the theory in the world, but we don't teach practical things. Think about the kid that you see down there at the local, local fast food restaurant that uh, rings up your order, you give him a $20 bill, and he looks at the cash register stunned for about 30 seconds before he can figure out how to make any change for you. You know, a kid like that could probably tell you all about multiculturalism. He could probably tell you all about global warming. He could probably tell you all about all these different cultures in the world. And he could probably tell you all about political correctness, but he can't freaking make change. Let's take our educational system and focus it more on what they used to call the three R's, reading, writing, and arithmetic. That's what we've lost sight of. That's what our employers need in terms of skill tests from our employees. They don't need employees that can tell you all about Black History Month or Hispanic History Month or uh, any number of other cultures around the world or conflict resolution or any of that. They need someone who can freaking count. They need someone who can read, someone who can write, someone who can make judgments. What we used to teach people. That's one of the problems with education. A second problem with education and something that you never hear the left talk about. The second problem of education is that we have lost our focus on the American family. We have destroyed the American family largely through left-wing political maneuvers and left-wing ideas and left-wing programs, also through the culture, also through Hollywood, but the bottom line is we no longer have the intact American families that we used to have. And I think that shows up in our schools. Let's be honest about it. You can have the most dedicated, hardworking teacher in the world. And there's a lot of them out there. Make no mistake about it. I'm not, I'm not going off on teachers here. A lot of them do a thankless job. I mean, yeah, there's a few knuckleheads out there. Don't get me wrong. But a lot of them do a thankless job and will never achieve the success in that job in terms of getting the kids that they would like to. And the reason a lot of them aren't able to do it is because so many kids come to school ill-prepared to learn. Because they do not have a structure at home. They do not have backup at home reinforcing the learning process that is there in school. You know, I don't care how dedicated of a teacher you have, how much money you pour into education, how much brand new shiny equipment you have, how new your school is, I don't care how small your class size is, it won't matter if the child does not have a solid family structure at home. There is nothing you can do in the eight hours of a day at a school to make up for the other 16 hours of the day that that kid experiences. And because we have looked at the traditional American family as little more than a lifestyle choice, we have played a great role in retarding the intellectual development and the, the learning development of our children. Even in, in, in a well-meaning school, even in a school that was doing things the right way, even in a school that really was focused on the practical instead of the theoretical, they would have little of a chance of reaching a lot of these kids. I mean, when your mom's a crack whore and isn't there to cook you dinner, cook you breakfast, or to make sure you get your homework done, well, what hope is there? Those kind of problems cannot be solved by the educational establishment. They can only be solved by refocusing on reforming the American family. So what is the role of government in all of this? What should the role of government be in solving these problems? Well, let's take a look at what Barack Obama thinks the role of government should be. In the long term, we have to rethink our tax system more fundamentally. 
We have to ask ourselves, do we want to make the investments we need in things like education, in research, in high-tech manufacturing, all those things? So why should the government be the ones making these type of investments, or these type of decisions, or these type of calls? Why should we, when you say the government is making these investments, that means you and I are making those investments. Why should you and I make those investments when we're not going to profit off of them? Let the private sector do it. Let the private sector take the risk. The recent past shows that this is foolhardy. That when the government appears to have the back of business, then business will start making more irrational decisions. One of the reasons we had the financial problems we have today, and we had all the bailouts, was that so many companies figured that if they went belly up, if they took these huge risks, and they didn't work out that the government would be there to bail them out. And guess what? They were right. What you must have in order to foster an environment where companies and, and businesses will make fiscally responsible decisions is that you must have an environment where the government is not there to bail those companies out. Where they are not providing research, where they are not providing development, where they are not providing direction. You know, I'm for a country in which we are all on our own. That includes business. Government does not need to be there pulling the levers of business or pulling the levers of individuality if for no other reason than they have shown and they have proven that they are horrible at it, that they cannot be successful at it. So what should we take from all of this? Again, these were just a few select uh, snippets from the speech. It goes on and on and, and, and it's like I say, it's a Marxist speech as much as anything. Karl Marx would have been proud. Maybe Groucho Marx would have been proud, I don't know. But what should we take from this? What should we take going forward when dealing with Obama and the left? First of all, we must always remember the difference between opportunity and success. And that an inequality of success, which is constantly trumpeted by Barack Obama, by the American left, by the Occupy Wall Street crowd, by the media, by the, the, news, uh, the news channels other than Fox, that such a difference and inequality of success does not mean an inequality of opportunity. Everybody in this nation can go, to, go get an education. How good that education is is another question. But everybody can go get an education. There's more access to higher education than ever. There's grants, there's loans. Yeah, I know people are going to complain about the loans, but guess what? A lot of people out there that are complaining about being in debt coming out of college. I wonder how many of those people have something like an English degree or a philosophy degree or a women's studies degree or something like that. You ever notice how you almost never hear that out of someone with an engineering degree? The problem is not that you're in debt for going to school. It's that you went to school for something that could not remunerate you once you got out to the point that you could pay off the loan. Sorry, tangent there. There is no shortage of opportunity in this country. There is an inequality of success because, quite frankly, some people take better advantage of that opportunity than others. And speaking of success, the use of government to equalize success or to more evenly distribute it or to more evenly balance that success is the antithesis of what America is about. And quite frankly, it's an idea like that that has been the genesis for countless tyrannical regimes and, and dictatorial regimes the world over. Now relax, I'm not saying Barack Obama is a dictator. I'm not calling him Pol Pot or Hitler or anybody. But I will say this, that it's ideas very much like those that Obama is expounding upon that open the door and start the chain reaction to tyrannical regimes going forward. I'm not saying Obama's going to start marching people to the gas chamber, but it might be the guy that comes after him that does it, or it might be the second or third liberal leader that comes after him, and Obama will have been the one that started the chain reaction. It is these ideas that have led to most of the destruction that the world has seen over world history. Also, we must remember that today's fiscal environment is the result of an advocacy government, not the result of a lack of advocacy by government. It is the result of the American people buying into the notion 
that we should spend money we don't have to fund a government we did not need. It is the idea that the government should be a solver of all problems, a distributor of all things, a distributor of all opportunity. That those roles should be assigned to government. That's what put us in this pickle. We did not always think that way. We did not always think that government needed to provide a safety net. And it's the existence of those safety nets and those government programs and those various means of government interference, those are what we are spending our money on. And some of you are jumping up and down screaming about war. The military is less than 20% of our budget. Entitlement programs are over half. That's where the money is being spent. And finally, we must all remember, unlike what Obama said in his speech, we are all better off on our own. Or at the very least, we're all better off when our individual actions are reflective of the self-interest of ourselves and our families first and foremost. Now, there's nothing wrong with giving to your neighbor. There's nothing wrong with taking into account the other guy once you've got things pretty well set, set up for your own self and your family. There's nothing wrong with that at all. But it should be voluntary. And heck, we've seen through history that Americans, Americans respond to voluntary charity like few others do. My goodness, if there's an earthquake or a tsunami anywhere in the world, who is there to open the checkbooks? Individual Americans. That's what we do. But when you take that individual charity and you take and you move that role to government, you then have theft. You then have tyranny. If someone walks up to you in an alley and puts a gun to your head and demands your wallet, they take your wallet, your cash, and your credit cards, you would call that theft. It would be a reprehensible act. But what if someone came up to you in an alley, put a gun to your head, took your wallet, took your money, took your credit cards, and then gave them all to a homeless guy the next block over? Would the act be any less reprehensible? No, absolutely not. It would be absolute theft. Well, that's what government charity is. Taking from those who have earned and giving to those who largely refuse to earn. Let me be very clear. And I, I'm not saying I speak for all conservatives or I speak for Tea Party or anybody else. I've told you from day one on this show. I speak for myself and nobody else. But let me be clear. I, for one absolutely refuse to subjugate my self-interests and the self-interests of my family for the alleged interests of any sort of collective. Whether, we're taught, whether we call it a community, whether we call it society, whether we call it the country as a whole, I, under no circumstances, will subjugate my self-interests for those of the community. And I'm getting the impression by people I talk to day in and day out that a growing number of Americans feel the same way. We have all been forced to foot the bill for the irresponsible for too long and it has brought us to the financial brink. That's what Barack Obama doesn't want you to realize. That's what Barack Obama doesn't want to admit. And that is the single issue that the 2012 election is all about. Barack Obama, in that speech, spouted off some extremely anti-American ideals. And that means that he is the biggest domestic threat facing this nation. The biggest domestic threat facing America currently resides in the Oval Office. And in 2012, it is time for America to rise up and deal with this domestic threat. The mask is off. The curtain is up. You know who he is. We said it all along. You don't have to give us credit for pointing out. But now, you do have to realize it. The enemy is here. He is among us. He resides in the White House. And it is time to take our country back. This is America's Evil Genius. We'll see you next week.